Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Day 4 with the man Frank Scalish. We've been telling stories. We've been, I always want to say the word bloviating. Yes, it's We're bloviating. <laughs> We've been bloviating recently and uh, Frank called and he said, Matt, he said, we got we to have a talk. He said, we haven't had enough maps. We haven't had enough in-depth deep dives he goes and i've also gotten some dms about natural lakes i said interesting so last week we were going to do it and then we actually bloviated for the, the hour away. <laughs> the whole show so we just saved it for this week so we have deals new products new colors new apparel and a deep dive episode on natural lakes how's that sound for uh april 18th 2024 yeah and and some stories to relate to the natural lakes um yeah it's i'm excited about today's show i wish it was longer um and i wish i could i wish i could i i'm gonna i'm teasing this i wish i could i wish i could blow the whistle on some upcoming things but i i can't but i might but but we'll see is that what you kind of showed me but we're like ah, i shouldn't really be showing you this yeah it is 100 percent. but I, I have an idea that i think i could sneak it in there and, and not get in too much trouble well, you threatened <laughs> your italian side came out you threatened me that if i showed or took a screenshot of it it would, that be I would have a, a severed boar's head on my doorstep the next morning because that it, would be that listen <laughs> That it is really alert. cool though. It, it it is really cool though. I will say this is cannot here's how I'll tease it. Yeah, you do it, man. Congratulations. It. It's really cool. Thanks, man. I but it. It, it there's a hint in there just by congratulating Frank on what I've seen, yeah. right? That's a good hint. 100 yeah, right? That dude, that is so money. So 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 here's the thing. All right. So I I, I went on a small rate, um, a small tie rate this morning. Um, not, not too over the top. Um, but it could have got over the top, but, um, anyway, so there is, this is the coolest thing. This is the coolest thing ever. (laughs) Okay. I, and I didn't do the shirt and I'm really pissed that I didn't do it because it's, it's very cool. So on, on LureNet, there's a thing we're doing right now called shad week. Okay. And so I'm so pissed. I didn't do this. So it's shad week. All right. So there's going to be specials. Like, I mean, like seriously, dude, come on. That shirt is absolute money. So it's got a gizzard shed in there. There's that, uh, the Luke Palmer got one of those shirts. Where's yours, uncle Frank? I don't rate. I don't got, I should have had a box of those things here. I would, I would wear the silk screen off of it. Um, But anyhow, so, and I love the shad because honest to God, dude, it's a shad. (laughs) Whoever designed that is, is brilliant. That is a fantastic. And then they trademark shad week. I see a little TM next. Yeah, I I know, dude. I, like I said, I'm so pissed. I didn't think of it. Those guys, some of our creative team down there are really on top of it, man. I have to give them that they are on top of that. Um, I want a hoodie like that in the worst possible way, but only a high quality hoodie, like all the day four and BTL hoodies are now. Absolutely. I won't, I won't tolerate a POS, but, um, so anyway, so there's going to be specials going through shad week and the first special that they have. Okay. So you guys remember a, a long time ago, I did a show with an old suspending rattling rogue. I took the Chrome and blue one and I scratched all. Oh the yeah. Off of it. Yeah. 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 That was one of the most viewed shows in day four history. Right. So that bone color. Okay. That bone color. They matched it. They matched it in spinner bait skirts and heads and they matched it in the the swim jig and the, so it's, it's in the covert series spinner bait and the finesse covert series spinner bait. And they did trailers. Look at, I'm like a kid in a candy store and they did. They got tra- you those though, at least. Well, yeah. That, you think they'd have thrown in the old shad week shirt when they sent you the bone covert yeah, that, spinner baits. That would have been nice. So, and they got the trailers <laughs> in bone. Now I know that this bone probably is not showing up 
super good on my computer screen, but it is it is the real bone color. Here, it it is think, the real. Does that show up better? Yeah, yeah that see. shows up. So better. it's like that. Yeah, it's like that old old yellowish, yes. rogue plastic color. Hundred percent. So this is the bone bone. So let's talk about this for a minute. Um, I know we covered it when I scratched the paint off of the rogue. I know we covered it, but here's the deal with that particular tone of bone. Okay. In clear water, we're getting demonetized. Anyway, continue. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> oh yeah, Matt, bring it down, buddy. Bring it down. Keep going. And, and so, so with that color of bone, um, in clear water, it has a subtle vibrancy to it very realistic but pretty visible okay but in off-colored water the thing practically glows mm -hmm. all right but here's the neat here's the neat characteristic of bone it will take on based on the color of your water not clarity color like there's some waters that are super clear and they and they're really clear, and they, but they look like Coca-Cola, tannin-colored water. Some water is clear, but it has a green hue to it. Some water is clear, but it has a brown hue to it. And then, of course, you've got your off-colored water that's just got a lot of particulate matter in it, and it could get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. So this bone color takes on different effects based on how that water clarity is. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why the, that's why the bone color is such a good color. So here's another thing. I want to show you guys something because where did I put it? Um, there's another thing about the bone. Oh, here it is. The bone soft plastics. All right. So everybody knows I have a chartreuse, a chartreuse dye pen here. Everybody knows that if you take a pearl white bait and you put the chartreuse on it, it's a very pearly bright chartreuse but if i were to take it and i'm going to show you and i'm going to actually show you how i do it on on my swim bait trailers so i'll take the sharpie or not sharpie the this is pen. like a, a gar is this like a zoom pen yeah or like this a is a, okay it's a, it's a zoom pen no garlic i don't like garlic but really yeah yeah no this doesn't that smell like a marker yeah but it don't matter you don't think that matters? No, dude. I catch so I many. I mean, if I have to choose between garlic and marker, I'm going garlic every time. All right. Well, you do the garlic one day. I'll do the regular marker, and we'll see if it makes a difference. Because I, I don't catch think the fish does. that want to get high. I think I catch the fish that are in the mood for spaghetti. That's true. That's true. Okay. So what I do is I'll take this thing and on the back. Oops. On the back of the paddle. I start at the top and I go heavy on the top and then I'll feather it down to the bottom. So it's almost, oh yeah, you're okay. See how it, see how it, 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 whoops. See how it fans out. It's feathered. It's not the whole thing. It's feathered. Yep. So I, you guys can, here, let me do it. Darling. I'm sure I, I don't know why I can't go. I don't know why I can't go. Any, any, anyhow, it's it's my lighting. In why here. do we never use that layout? Don't you like that layout better than this layout like we normally do? I don't know. Let me see it. Oh, that's so weird to me. I know, but what's the purpose of that layout if we have oh. this layout? Okay, so randomly switch it throughout the show. <laughs> I don't know what to anyway, tell you. So sorry, anyway, I was trying to go full screen so people could see that easier. But. That's okay. It's it's my lighting. So let me see something here. Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. So so anyhow, so that's how I feathered it out. Then on the back top of the tail, I'm gonna now I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to put this thing down so you won't see me do it. But I'm I'm going on the back of the top of the skinny part of the tail so all you're going to get is that right on the back now here's the cool thing about this this is not 
Should I leave this light off? That's oh. up to you. Okay. So this is not very vibrant. So what this does on the bone is it almost has more of a chartreuse green look to it. It's not that bright, bright, bright yellow chartreuse. Mm -hmm. It's more of a subdued green. So this is how I, this is how I tint my, the, my bone color trailers. So on the spinner bait, you're going to have, I'm going to knock this off now on the spinner bait. What you're going to have is you have the bone and this is a finesse series um, covert, but on the spinner bait, you're going to have the, the bone with that little flash of chartreuse on it. It's very subtle, but man, does it make a difference? There's, there's a lake by me that, 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 that is the killer move right there on it. Most of the guys that live here will know what lake it is, but that's the killer like move. And that's how, and that's how I doctor up the bone series. But now, and they also have, you know, the swim bait trailers for the swim bait. So I'm going to show you two things. This is a pet peeve I have. I never take a jig, a swim jig or anything and tie it on and shove a trailer on it. So the first thing I do is I take the skirt. See how I have it separated? The front mm -hmm. is forward. The back is backwards. So here's basically the, all the strands that are above the, I'm right. just for the iTunes listeners, the all, every strand that is above the rubber band goes over the head. Yeah. And, and so you're just strand, separating it. Right. And then every strand behind goes towards the hook. Okay. So, so here is, This is the proper way to trim. So the first thing I do is I take all the strands that are going over the head. And this is going to be weird to you guys, but I'm cutting them totally straight right across. I'm trimming them down about a half an inch and cutting them straight. Now I'm taking the strands that are hanging down from the bottom of the jig. And I am going to teardrop them. So if I'm starting at the bottom of the skirt and I'm cutting at an angle up and cutting at an angle up on top of the skirt. So I have a teardrop shape on it. You see the teardrop? Yep. Okay. So when you drop the jig down, look at how it flares. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay. Because if you don't, the strands in the front are too long and they lay over the strands in the back too tight. It doesn't flare as much. Yeah, that's so, really cool. And so when I put the trailer on, now watch what happens when the trailer goes on. So this is just, this is a yum crotch. chunk. The trailer's going on and I can't see, but we're going to, hopefully it's straight. So when the trailer goes on and I smash it up against the rubber band, now look at how it flares. Mm -hmm. So what that does when you're doing the pump and the shake with the thing, it's going to do more of that undulating movement. Breathing. It's going to breathe better. And that's how you do the swim jig. So anyway, that is my, that's my bone series detour from today's show. But I had. I like to, it. That's a hell of a tip. Yeah, because, and I do the same thing with the spinner bait, by the way. I trim it the same way. You can see the top ones are flat. And then the bottom ones come to a point. But here's the trick with the spinner bait: Do not have your bottom ones hanging far enough down that it interferes with the movement of your trailer. You want it above that so your paddle tail swims. And that's the, those are the that those are my tips right there. And and trust me, they work. Beautiful. Anyway. Shadweek Bone Series available now. LureNet.com. Use code capital BTL24 at checkout. Now well, how much off do they get? 15% off regularly price items. So yeah, and BTL I think lawyer listener. Loyal now, listener. Now remember code. this. If there's a discount offered on the site already, the doesn't, discount code yeah, is, doesn't work. Doesn't work. But anyhow, so yeah, so that is. But I mean, dude, you with fifteen percent off, they're only the spinner baits are only ten bucks. Trailers are only three forty nine. So I mean, in today's right day right. and age, if you can get a 
Hildenbrandt bladed covert series spinner bait for eight fifty. That's a pretty pretty good deal. Oh, without a doubt, dude. I mean, I, I I've never I, I, here. I'll be honest with you. I, I've I used to change all my spinner bait blades out to Hildebrandt blades, and. <laughs> Frank forgot to use the code. Remember last time you forgot <laughs> yeah, to use the code. I did it again. D- Drunkwood Drunkwood called me. He he he's been smashing them on some of the FX rogues. And I and I I went downstairs after we had a conversation. He just he just took second in an event on one of the FX color rogues. And I I have them. I have a box of them. And I had gone downstairs and lo and behold, I, I didn't have any on the wall backups. So, so they only sent me three of each of them. Okay. And I had put, I had put them in my boat and realizing, thinking that I'm going to get more and I didn't get more. So I, so drunk would call me and he's like, dude, I got to get more of those rogues, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, go to lure. How does he do, like, how is he, how many rogues is he going through? I'm not sure, but I, I don't care. I mean, as long as you're catching fish on it, dude, if I catch four pound smallies on them, I'll break one every day if I can catch. You That's know. true. That's so, true. So at any rate, so here, so I go on lure net and they're, they have stock in them. So I, I order a bunch of them. Okay. And I was in such a hurry to get my order in and then call Drunkwood and tell them they're still available on LureNet. I forgot to plug in the BTL code. And so I paid full price for them. So I called Drunkwood. I said, dude, they're, they got them on LureNet. Get them, get them right now because I don't know how much stock is available. Get them right now. And don't forget to use the BTL code because I just ordered $150 worth and forgot to put to, to do the code. And so he texts me back later on that night, a couple of la- a laughy faces. And he said, I forgot to use the effing code too. <laughs> That's the whole point of the code is to show the value of BTL to lure net so they can continue to, su- to sponsor day four. Well, a hundred percent, but you know what? I was in such a hurry and I was so amped up because I, I, I don't have enough of them to last me. So especially where I live, because we got a lot of pike here. And so you could lose one. You could literally make five casts and lose four of them. You know what I mean? So, so I literally, I don't, I don't, didn't have enough. So I was freaking out. Anyway, I was so excited that they still had them that I ordered them and just, you know, click buy now right away. And then boom over, I missed it. So, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> come on guys this come on my, guys this is my livelihood here use the code save use money. the code please benefits everyone code. all right deep dive natural lakes so natural lakes and then and then stay tuned because you at the end of the show after oh, this yeah. you te- have I'm... are gonna tease it and then you also have a major life announcement Oh yeah, I forgot about that too. <laughs> oh, you can't say that. You can't. Do, we have to. We're gonna have to strike that line from the show. You can't forget about that. Major no, life. Major life announcement. Yeah. So yeah. So I was telling my buddy about the fishing day I had the other day, and we were going through the whole day, and then we got off on the tangent about, um, you know, saving the world from its own problems, and then and I said, oh yeah, by the way, blah, you, you got to save it to the end of the show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So you better just remind here. I'm going to write a note right now. So oh I, my gosh. I don't forget. That's just how my brain works, guys. I'm talking about something, but I'm thinking four things ahead of time. But so. it's shad week. You don't understand. Yeah, it's shad <laughs> week for crying out loud. All right. Have at it. Natural lakes, Frank. Okay. So everybody. So I always say if you you have a show idea. DM me or email Matt at BassZone.com the idea and then we'll put it into play. I 
got a DM, a guy wanted to know about natural lakes. Well, as fate may have it, I got like three or four more DMs on the same subject. So I said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it because, because I know if I get three or four, there's way more that want to know about it. If I get one, it's iffy, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? But if I get more than one, I know that there's people that want it. So we're doing natural lakes. So the first thing that you have to understand is, you know, a, a natural lake is, is really a lake without evidence of a dam or a lake that was naturally and they natural and they put a dam in it to maintain a water level. It's not a functioning dam. In other words, it's not generation electric power, none of that shit. It's just to keep the water level maintained. Okay. Most natural, most natural lakes occur in five regions. Basically it's your, it's your upper Midwest. It's your Northern Appalachians, your temperate plains, and obviously the coast. Okay. So if you were to look at a, if you were to look at a map, now I got to go through some of my drawings here because I don't, I should have put them in order. Oh, here we go. So if you were to look at a map, this map will indicate where most of natural lakes occur. All right. So you can see, you know, you can see where you're going to find most of the natural lakes. Now there's natural lakes dotted all amongst there, amongst the central part of the United States, but there's not enough to count. There's not enough to make a difference in, you know, in that map so that's why a lot of it's empty if you see dots there there's a lot of them there so anyhow so that's this is where most of the natural lakes occur and this is the map that i was making when i got sharpie all over my stinking computer screen so anyhow so so that's that now um just to for the sake of this show we're not talking about the great lakes we know they're natural lakes. We're not going to talk about them because they're very different than most of the natural lakes that you're going to find, you know, throughout the United States. So here's the first things to consider. Was the lake formed by a glacier or was the lake formed because it was part of a floodplain? They will have two very different makeups. A glacier lake will have long flats that come out and and steep steep break lines on the flats. Um, They'll have more rock involved in it. They'll be both um, like, you know, like St. Clair is a glacier lake, but it has both grass and rock. So you have to determine the makeup of the lake. Uh, Most of Florida lakes, flood plains, they're shallow, they're flat. Um, most of the structure you're going to encounter in Florida is old shell beds, old coral beds, you know, stuff that were pertaining to the ocean that built Florida, basically. So you got to keep this stuff in mind. Um, is the lake a grass lake or is the lake completely void of grass? Now, most of the people in, in that are going to experience natural lakes, it is going to have grass in them. Some of the ones farther up north may not, based on the mountainous region that they're in. So you got to keep that in mind also. Um, Champlain, Oneida, the Finger Lakes in Florida, those are those give you the best mix of all the worlds combined. You'll have rocks, you'll have offshore structure, you'll have grass flats, et cetera, et cetera. So you know... So you got to remember where you're at and what you're looking at. That's very important. So the dish bowl type grass lakes, all right, these are what most people are going to encounter. Um, they're pretty mundane. There might be a few structural breaks in them, but for the most part, they're pretty mundane. Grass is the predominant cover source. Um, it lacks structure. I'm not going to say there won't be any because I haven't been on a natural lake where I haven't found some. Um, it's just not going to be so prevalent. Okay. So, so then, so what that happens is you're going to say, okay, well, vegetation is the most important thing. What makes 
this grass patch better than that grass patch. And the, the reality is going to be two things, bottom composition and is there more than one specific type of vegetation in the area? What I have found on all these lakes, if I come in, con in contact with two or more types of vegetation, that's usually holding the fish. The other thing I noticed about it is there are times when the bass will be grass specific, where they want coontail, or they want milfoil, or they want hydrilla, or they want rice, or bulrushes, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to, you can pattern the bass based on the, the different types of vegetation that are found in the lake. Um, the coolest thing is, is what I like to do, because I, I am, I like offshore fishing a ton. Um, I can't get away from it. I always look for the deepest grass that's growing in the lake. That is going to tell you the, the main, you don't, that you don't necessarily have to ever fish deeper than the deepest grass grows. And so that eliminates piles of water on these lakes. If you know the grass only grows down eight feet, you don't have to worry about deeper. You follow me? So that's a trick. That's a good trick for if you're if you're an offshore guy and you in your fishing grass lakes. Um, the other thing is uh, what I like to do is, and I say this all the time, every time we talk about any lake with grass in it, I always look for grass with rock or hard bottom outside the edges of it. And here's and here's the thing on these dish pan type, you know, mundane lakes. You're going to encounter a lot of sand, um, depending in some of the backwater areas, you're going to encounter mud and muck. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to look for bottom composition. And generally speaking, sand to hard bottom is better than mud and muck, except sometimes in the spring, the dark bottoms warm up faster. So the bass that are back there already will be a little bit more active. Their bass aren't seeking out the muddy bottoms. It's just the ones that are already back there might have experienced a you know, two to four degree water temperature difference and maybe a little more active. So here's what, here's what we're looking at. So this is typically what I would look for. And remember in a shallow dish pan lake, any little break line, any little drop in bottom contour, this could be a foot to two feet. It doesn't have to be a massive 15 foot drop. It could just be a couple of feet. That's going to be a fish holding area right here because there's not a lot of structure in the lake. Mm -hmm. My favorite thing in the world to look for in grass is isolated rocky bottom right outside the grass edge. Now, sometimes what happens is the rock will creep up into the grass and you'll see that the grass is growing but there'll be a few open pockets of, of where there's no grass growing. You could bet your bottom dollar that that's rock bottom. It doesn't have to be big boulders. It could be slate or shale, but it's going to be rock and hard bottom and the grass won't grow there. So those are little pockets of high percentage places that you can. That's like for. 95 to a hundred percent bite in certain lakes. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Like you find one of those on Oneida in the summertime oh, and there's a bunch of them. You're smoking. You 100 percent of the time, 100 percent of the cast in those will get a bite by something. Correct. Either a pickerel, a walleye, a goggle eye, a large mouth or a small mouth. Yeah, 100 percent. Um, So that's that's traditionally what I look for. The other thing I want to find is I want to find broken edges. And when I say broken edges. You'll see the grass. It may not be all the way to the top, but you'll see the grass. And then you'll see parts where it starts to dissipate. And there you might see an isolated clump here or an isolated clump here. And then it gradually disappears. So what you're looking at is there's probably a gradual slope in the bottom. The light penetration isn't getting down good enough. And the grass is starting to break up where it's not going to grow anymore. And so those that come out, they, they usually form in the form of fingers or gradual 
tapering flats. Now, mm -hmm. one of my favorite techniques is cranking grass. I crank the grass edges. A lot of guys don't do this because it's honestly, it's a pain in the rear end because <laughs> if you're not, if you, you have to pay attention. So I'm going to go on a tangent, but this is, this is a, this is a juice giver right here. So you have to pay attention. So what I do is I have on my cranking rods, especially when I, when I'm cranking grass, I have, I have my pow rod set up with different line sizes. I have 12, 14, 17, 20. Okay. Where I may have a DD 22 and I'll have it on 20 and 17. And then I'll take a deep little end and I'll put it on um, 14 and 12. So now here's what happens. I have control over how deep that bait is going. So as that grass starts to change levels on me, depth ranges. And when I say the grass changes depth, where I'm talking about where the grass line ends or where it starts to get shorter and shorter as it gets deeper and deeper. Like this here. I, I, I'll just show you guys because this will be. Okay, so as the grass gets down deeper and deeper, it's not going to be as tall. So I know in this range, can you see this? Cause I can't. Oh yeah, no, it's perfect. I know in this range here, I'm throwing my deep little ends and I'm going to throw 14 up here, 12 down here. Then I'm going to get my DD 22s because, because this might only be eight or nine feet and I want to kill the depth on these crankbaits. I don't want them to dive maximum. Mm -hmm. So I want to kill the depth. So I'll go to my heavier my heavier line for this range in here where I'm just ticking the tops of the grass every now and then you'll, you'll get hung up in the grass and you just snap the rod a couple of times and poof it through the grass. That's you're going to get tons of strikes doing that. The other trick I do is I'll poof it through the grass and then I kill the bait. And as the bait, because a, a DD 22 will back up a lot at rest as it flows to the surface because of the build design it backs up and a deep little end will back up but it doesn't back up as much because the build design's a little narrower and a little smaller but it'll still back up so i notice with the dd22 a lot of times when i snatch it through the grass and i kill it it starts to back up and the bass literally blows slack in the line when they eat it now, out for this range out here, because this is going to be my deepest range in this particular body of water, this I'm going to put a DD-22 on 12 because I need it to get maximum depth to reach the edge where the grass stops growing. And that's, those are, these are my, my crankbait tips, okay? And I also will experiment with different vibrating, the way the bait pitches and rolls and vibrates. So, on some lakes, the fat free seven might be getting it done because it's a little more wild. Um, so you have to experiment with different build designs also like the NXS. If I've got a big flat that I'm fishing uh, and, and I know that flat is 10 to 12 or 10 to 15, I'll throw the NXS because it gets right down to the depth and I can just keep it bumping the top of the grass. And it, and I'm on that flat the whole time. Cause when you're fishing flats, right? You're not necessarily fishing a structural element, although there may be isolated boulders on that flat, isolated grass patches on that flat. You're trying to cover water because the fish are generally roaming on that flat. It, they're using it to feed. Like here, I was, I was out fishing Tuesday. Um, my cameraman and I went out Tuesday. And that's exactly what happened. There, there was a big flat in the lake and it had a mixture of rock and grass on it. The flat was anywhere from four to eight feet deep before it dropped off into the abyss. And it drops, it drops off at the end of this flat, like poof, straight down. So I knew that the small mouths use this flat to spawn, but they're not spawning yet because the water temperature is only 50 degrees over there. So I said, we're just going to cover water. We're going to run into the fish that are cruising on the flat. So I picked up the rogue and I started catching them, 
catching small outs on the rogue on one of my FX colors. So the wind died on us. It, the lake literally went slick flat glass. And I'm like, well, the, the rogue bite's over. We need wind. It's over. So I said, let's put some flick shakes on. I got a section of the lake we could go catch largemouth, and maybe the wind will pick up later. So we we abandoned what we were doing, and we ran out, and we went largemouth fishing, and we were catching them flick shaking. And basically, the whole trick to that was finding the isolated grass patches, not the big wafts of grass, even though it's all immature now because it's not grown up on this lake, but but where there's sand and gravel mixed in and the grass is just growing in isolated clumps. And we started catching the largemouth there. And of course, boat docks, because here on any natural lake, anywhere you fish in the country, if you have man-made structure, you need to fish it because it is not normal to the lake and the bass use it. It could be it could be sunken brush piles, it could be boat Ooh, docks, sunken brush piles. Here, I'll do that again. Sunken brush piles. It could be it could be boat docks. It could be retaining walls. Anything man-made on a natural lake, especially Magnet. in the spring, you need to be fishing it. Period. That's the whole deal. Um, Another trick, another trick that I like to look for on natural lakes, and a lot of guys more more up north will mm -hmm. see this. Um, driftwood, and it, when it's when you have big storms and floods, and the trees fall in, and the wind blows these big trees around, eventually they sink. So what I'll do is I'll start side imaging, looking for those big trees that sunk on the bottom, and they'll be isolated. And you'll find them in the most random, obscure places. Those can be fish magnets. Absolutely fish magnets. Now, you'll run into that more when you've got the natural lakes that are surrounded by more um, trees. And when you're in the grass plains, you're not going to run into trees. You're, you're, gonna, you're just not going to run into them because they're not there. But that's, but that's really it. Like... Back in the day, I had the worst time of my life fishing grass lakes. Like, I just couldn't figure it out. Um, I, because I was of the mindset, if there's grass there, there's bass there. And, and, I, and I would, it was so hit or miss for me. If I, go ahead. No, I'm just oh, I, 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 was, I, got a, I got a question about it after you're done with it, though. Okay, so... So little by little, what I started to realize was there's always determining factors that make some areas of a grass bed better than other areas. And usually it's bottom composition, a high spot, a ditch or a drain or rock. Something is different in that section of the grass or it's more than one type of vegetation together. Um, that's usually the deal breakers right there. Go ahead. Okay. So the man-made brush piles on natural lakes, I don't want to get into the legality of it on whether or not you should, but I'm thinking like Minnesota, New York on these natural grass lakes, right? It's man. And you mentioned anything man-made on natural lakes, oh, but yeah. in my experience in talking to people there, like guys don't go sink brush piles on Oneida. No, um, the re reason being is I, th there are some sunken brush piles on Oneida. I found okay. them, okay. but but the but the reason being is there's so much, especially Oneida and Champlain. There's so much good fishable structure. You don't need it. it. You don't need it if you get on the right pattern depth type of vegetation rock whatever okay if you're on the right pattern you could literally run blind and run the pattern and catch fish um champlain is probably champlain's probably been the most effective lake for me to fish for some stupid reason um i think i've got 
I don't even know. I I don't know. I got I've got like three uh seventh and eighth place finishes, uh second place finish. I've just got a lot of Do you imagine hot... going out there with what your bass tank setup is now? Dude, it'd be no, like a I, different lake. Dude, I am freaking out already using it. Like like here. All right, so I have to give a shout out to the tank um for helping me get everything set up on my boat and of course frankie for rigging everything for me because yeah. i couldn't they the, the guys at the tank wanted to rig the boat for bass me, tank the bass tank the bass tank the guys at the bass tank couldn't they wanted uh, to he's just he's kind of like that scott yeah he's his very, hands on it and wants very, to be on the water and make sure and like it's very yeah, hands on pra practicality goes out the window when it comes to wanting to make sure that someone's right and and i love it's rigged right and i love that about them mm -hmm. i absolutely love that but i couldn't drive all the way there just to have <laughs> the boat rigged you yeah. know what i mean it was just it's too basic to one unit 134 transducer that's it right it was too it was it's too not basic. like frank's doing a seven screen up front with nine transducers <laughs> yeah 100 percent. it was too basic so i couldn't do it so i said just i'll i'll do it just let me know what i need to get and i'll get it and I, and then i'll do it and then of course you know i went to frankie's house which is a lot easier drive because it's you know an hour and 40 minutes instead of 15 <laughs> hours hours so, yeah so but here so here's what i here's why i love it so much okay Yes, I have taken it out, and yes, I have scoped bass on it. That's not what excites me. What excites me is when I'm fishing the grass edges that I talk about so much, my cast, my accurate casting is almost 80% where I make the right cast first. Now, every now and then I'm going to cast in too high of a grass area, but that's just because you don't see everything if the wind's blowing around you're just scanning you go there's the grass edge and you make the cast you might not you might have missed a finger of grass sticking out a little bit farther so about 80 percent of the time i'm making the most accurate cast right off the rip which is way which is way more effective than the way i used to do it i used to fan cast the edge of the grass where i assumed it was going until i stopped burying my crankbait up in the grass and so that's one of the things I like about it. The other thing I like about it is when I stroll up on a brush pile, I can see the brush pile mm -hmm. and I can cast right in it first time right in it. I know I'm hitting it. I'm not to the right. I'm not to the left. And of course, if I see fish suspending off the right or the left, I can pick up my jerk bait or my crank bait or my Damiki and swim it down there and catch the ones that are not in that brush pile. So there's definitely distinct advantages uh, to forward facing sonar, especially for me as a structure fisherman, because I can see the rock piles, I can see all of it, and I know right where it is, and I know right where my cast has to go. So it's not, you know, if you think the only advantage of that, the, of, of that type of technology is to go in the middle of the lake and scope bass, you're missing a whole nother way to fish with it completely. So, yeah, I mean, here the other day we slaughtered them and I didn't cast that one fish that I saw on forward facing sonar. Uh, Which is but, but back to the brush piles. Would, would they even get, like like I said, throw what you can and can't legally do. Right. Should a should a hardwood brush pile end up in the middle of Champlain? Would those fish even migrate to it? Would they get on it? As, well, or would it would would it? Okay, well, that's a good that's a really good question, Matt. Because random brush piles attract random fish. If you put the brush pile in the proper place, you're putting it in their migration zone. And they'll stop there and they'll use it. Even if it's in grass. Even if it's in grass, as long as it's it's as long as the grass doesn't choke the whole thing out. Although if it does, you could punch it. Um, then why is it not up there? Because I don't care who you are or what you are. If if they if those things are that effective, there's gonna be brush piles all over there. Guys are gonna find a way to get right. some wood in the water. 
Well, because there, a lot of those lakes are so prolific and have such good fishing in them, you don't need that to attract the bass and hold them there. Okay. I shouldn't say attract the bass. I should say hold it's them unnecessary there. work. Yeah, it's very unnecessary because you can catch them without it. That makes more sense. So, yeah. like in Oklahoma, you go out on a grassless, featureless rock lake, and it's very hard to pinpoint the fish. But if you drop a pile, you could go, okay, the fish are going to be here. You can do that on those natural lakes and still catch fish without right. going through the uh, without going through the process. Now, this is a good question by uh, Brett Anderson, which as we uh, wrap up the final 15 minutes of the show, some we're doing each and every show now is a 10 minute. Uh, it's not a power question. hour if it's 10 minutes, but a uh, rapid fire, <laughs> rapid fire questions. And I also do want to, uh, before we get into that, uh, talk about the color number seven that we are giving away this week's winner for the color number seven. So this week we will announce the winner next week because this is going to come from what you YouTube. deem to be uh, the best comment or question on this show. So if you're watching this as a replay on this show on YouTube and you subscribe to the BTL channel, the best comment or question from this show that will be up on April 18th, the winner of the color number seven will be selected on. So what did you say? April, 18th. April 25th. Oh, yeah, that's today, next week. Yeah. Today, so April 25th, we announced. Yeah. So you have to have your comments in by April 24th because we're going to have to record a show because I will be at the Bass Cat Owners meeting doing a live show on the 25th, which I just realized looking at my calendar right now. Okay. Which so also the, means I only have a week to get ready. So by the 24th, between the April 18th and April 24th, best comment on YouTube, comment or question on YouTube for Uncle Frank wins that one. I'm writing notes like a madman. Okay. All right. So, okay. So where are we at? We're taking questions. Yes. And Rapid the fire. first question is from uh, Brett Anderson, who said, how do cribs compare to brush piles? Well, cribs are also really good and they'll, they'll be in different depths of water. Also um, there's, there's cribs on Lake Erie, in fact, not that we talk, we're talking about the Great Lakes, um, but there's cribs on Lake Erie, and some of them are, uh, were made to for intakes, to protect the intakes and stuff like that, and some of them were put underwater. Well, I don't think they were supposed to be underwater, but the, le the lake level changes from time to time, and they're a little bit shallower. Cribs are really good, um, depending on where they're located in the lake will de determine what season um they're better at some some of the shallower ones are way better in the spring so you'll want to keep that in mind too uh doug going back wants to know uh when you were talking about when you're giving out uh are, are you throwing okay. uh, parallel or perpendicular like where where is the cast angles okay on what you showed before all right so here we are so if i got a gradual tapering transition like this yep and I don't know if the bass are in which zone the bass are at. I'm going to cast almost perpendicular to that. I want my crankbaits to run down the down the break. But if I know the bass are concentrated in a certain area, then I'll parallel that area and I'll fan cast that way on it. You so you'll me? checkerboard it almost like the yeah. graph paper. Yeah, a hundred percent. You have to, if you have a definitive grass edge where it's a definite yep. line, I'm paralleling it. The, the starker, the grass edge, the more parallel I'm going to be to it. The gra more gradual it tapers. I'm going to pick an angle till almost perpendicular with it. So I might start out at 45s or even, even 60 degree angles. And then I'm going to gradually go till I'm perpendicular casting you know, T-boning it. It just depends. But if it's a vertical grass edge, I'm always paralleling it. Always paralleling it. This is interesting. Uh, I was out graphing recently, found some three-inch wooden fence posts hammered into the bottom in the middle of a flat. Probably going to be a weed bed later. Thoughts? Yeah, somebody probably put those in as crappie mats. 
Okay. Uh, what they'll do is they'll take furring strips, uh, one by ones, two by twos, and they they pound them in or they they put them on pallets and then sink the pallets and there'll be vertical stakes and the crappies love them. And then you could, because there's nothing, no cross members and stuff like that, you can easily get your crappie lures and crappie jigs through all the stakes that stand up. I ran into that a ton on Kentucky Lake. Yep. A ton. There's a million crappie mats and they range from super shallow where the posts are sticking out of the water all the way down to 15 or 20 feet deep. And here's the weird thing, speaking about Kentucky Lake. The first time I ever fished Kentucky Lake, there there was no grass on it. And brush piles were the deal. They were the deal. Some years went by, I went back to Kentucky Lake, and it was loaded with grass. The brush piles didn't mean crap. The bass were relating to the grass. So just food for thought. Uh, have you seen what's happening on Kentucky Lake? That depends on what you're, what you're, there's a college tournament going on right now. No, I on Bassmaster. Look at this. Uh, yeah. Look at these. There was like a six eleven smallmouth weighed in on Kentucky. The yeah, winners had 22 plus in smallmouth. I mean, oh, there's a, some, a couple largemouth bags. Somewhat, yeah, quite a few largemouth bags, actually. But like a lot of all smallmouth, like plus yeah. 20 pound bags coming in on Kentucky Laker and like good looking smallmouth, too. Yeah, it's it's nice to see that um, back in the day, smallmouth were definitely a thing. But if you wanted to win, you had to have greenies in there with you. Um, now you could tell the lake's changing a little bit. I don't know if it's changing because of the fact of all the freaking Asian carp they got in there. Um, I know for a while there was so many of those carp in there that the offshore fishing for largemouth was getting pretty grim because the carp were occupying a lot of the structure mm -hmm. that the largemouth wanted. Um, and so, you know, Possibly because the smallmouth can become more pelagic, they're taking a better stronghold in the lake. Oh now. Lord, look at all those freaking limits of smallies. Yeah, that's that's sweet. Kentucky Lake. Yeah, man, it makes you kind of want to go back, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I fished Kentucky Lake was a Toyota series in 2019. I had a. Uh, Five keeper bites in two days. I cashed a check in 30th place. Wow. That's how rough it was. I had wow. four the second day and one the first day and finished 30th out of like 200 boats. Man, a lot. Well, that could that have been the, pr the that prime been. of the, uh, the prime of the Asian carp. Yeah. Did you, did you experiencing them jumping all over the place? When oh, you were I running? experienced yeah. And then I also experienced like you literally could not buy I was like fishing this flat and I thought I lost one a couple times. And it turns out like it was so thick with Asian carp. They were just, just like every line. Yeah, like and then you'd snag one. Uh all right, another question. Ohio River question from Derek. Uh is there a point at which the current actually starts slowing down when it's flooding, when the river's at its crest, it seems slower than just a few feet flooded? Okay, what you, it, the current's actually not slowing down. Um, what's happening is you, the higher the the higher the water gets above any kind of structural element that could create an eddy or a funnel zone, it's getting so high above it that it, your eddies will look slow and swirling instead of if the water's low, they're faster and swirling. Um, so what you're what you're seeing is the surface of it. It's just spreading out how that current's behaving. But no, unless they stop the flow from upriver, it's not going to slow the current down. As long as they're keeping it flowing, the current's going to be the same. But here's a trick on the Ohio River: um, when it gets when it's flooded, you need to fish all the eddy areas as as far up as you can go with it even behind the locks 
when you get behind the locks that go up. I've had some of my best smallmouth days when that place was completely flooded, fishing the locks, you know, behind where you go up into the lock, not where the water's a torrent coming down, but where it eddies around and it's in the shipping lane in the lock. I've, I've crushed them in there doing that. That's, uh, that's some good stuff. Uh, life, life update. You ready for the life update? Oh yeah. Heck. I you, can't, <laughs> can't, you can't say, you can't forget things like this, uncle Frank. Oh my God. This is something that you don't just forget. It's not like, Oh, we forgot the BTL code. Oh, I forgot a box of Ned heads at the house. This is not on that same level. Well, I am now a grandfather. My son, Noah, and his wife, Sydney, um, gave birth to a little baby girl whose name is Francesca, and they're going to call her Frankie for short. So another Frankie Scalish? Yeah, but but a female version. <laughs> yeah, but Frankie's a Frankie. Yeah, you can do a Frankie is either way. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, so that is what happened. Uh, Grandpa Frank, that, that's the first grandchild. Yeah. First one yesterday. Congratulations. Thanks. And I got to give a congratulations to them as well. I like how yesterday you told me and I was like, oh, that's cool. And you're <laughs> like, yeah. And then you're like, hold on, let me, let me check the phone. Yeah, everything's good. And then we just went right back to the conversation. <laughs> then we hung up and I was like, I was like, wait a second. That's a big, that's a big deal. Oh yeah, it is a big deal, you know? And, and it was so funny because my buddy Troy called me and I was talking about the, the fishing day I had Tuesday. And, um, and so we were going over all that and then we started to solve life's problems. And I said, oh yeah, by the way, dude, I'm a grandfather. He goes, you told me 10 things before you told me that. <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, that's great, man. That's so, great. yeah, are you now Grandpa Frank instead of Uncle Frank? Ah, who the hell knows? I don't know. I'll answer to anything as long as there's a Frank in it. You know, thanks, you guys, for all your well wishes. But you know what's funny? I don't know how you want to end the show. I, let's end the show on the uh, on Grandpa Frank. We'll end the show there because um, at least I didn't forget. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. Um, I, I don't forget. I don't forget. I just, there's a lot going on up here. And so some things just, I skim over them. You know what I mean? Pop, pop, yeah. Frank. <laughs> yeah, I think they're called, I think, she, I think it, it's, I'm a, a papa, a papa, I think. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool. Little that's tiny, very squirt, six, six pounds and change. I caught, I almost caught a large mouth as big as her the other day. How many inches long? That's <laughs> 24 <laughs> inches. What was the girth? She made the <laughs> slot. She made the slot limit. <laughs> you should like, seriously, right now would be the, one of the few opportunities that you need to get a length and girth and weight on your first granddaughter. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then see if you can catch a fish that is the exact same dimensions and then you can have the pictures next to each other and then years down the road. Do I have to lip them both? <laughs> did, did, oh, did this version of Frank Scalish ever think he would be a grandpa? No, that version that of Frank. That version of Frank was not thinking about life that, as a grandpa. No, that version of Frank was always scared to be a father. <laughs> that version of Frank probably terrified a lot of grandpas. Yeah, 100%. Uh, that's fantastic. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, that's good. Oh, you know what? What's that? Oh, is that the T? Don't get in trouble. I don't want you to get I in trouble. I don't know. I'm going to, I'm hiding the, I'm high. So hey, what I, go ahead. No, go ahead. I said, just don't, don't get in trouble. I'm going to try not to get in trouble, but if I do, I do. Little teaser, there's some things coming down the pike. Um, it'll probably break May 2nd. 
Oh, gonna, that's soon. Yeah, we're gonna start. Oh yeah, and then tease it. That's way. That's really soon. We're starting a signature series line of baits. Each bait is designed by me. My signatures are on them. The packages are numbered uh, from one to six hundred. It's one and done. And there is a we're going to drop them every single month starting May 2nd. It's a collectible. Or you can fish it. It doesn't matter, but it's I'm really excited about it. That's as much detail as I can get in right now. Um, it's going to be something really special to me anyway. But you yeah, to talk about that almost as passionately as the new grand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. No, I know is, you are. That is fantastic. I know you are. So yeah, so that's, um, that's, that's it, man. I mean, there's, you know, it's been a, yesterday was a good day. I'm not it, supposed to have seen that packaging, but I saw it. It is really cool. And I do like, I've never seen numbered baits like that before on the packaging. Yeah. The packaging, the card on the package has the numbers, um, the names, the everything on the packaging and the bait just has my signature on it. Um, so you could get a couple to fish with a couple to collect there. It's going to be a collectible because there's a series of them and then, and then it's going to be, you know, over. So it will be a, there will be a full set of collectability to them. So, yeah, it's really, it's kind of cool, really. I never thought in a million years, um, you know, I really never thought any, any of this, like what Matt and I are doing and all this stuff. Um, when Mark introduced me to the show and stuff like that, I never dreamed that, that this would develop from that. Well, and, you know, what actually started it, what actually kind of was like, Ah, there's something here. It was the glacial deposits show. Oh yeah, that when we did the when they were talking about the smallmouth because the tournament was up on Lake Erie, so you guys had me on to talk about the Great Lakes. And you mentioned glacial deposits, and it Mm -hmm. went from there. And then Mark was like, "Well, maybe you could, you know, drop some knowledge every week." And then right, then then he retired and or. Then he fell. So then we did some shows and then he, and then he retired. So then we really started to do some shows and now it, it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's funny how things um, evolve, you know, you, uh, speaking of things you never thought you'd ever see, uh, Rick Clun is on Bass Live scoping. What? Out in the middle. Yeah. It's freaking cool. The Clunster is using his eagle eyes. Yeah, I think he was on uh, Mercer's podcast. I feel bad because I'm so far behind. He's like one of the few other podcasts that I listen to. And I think he said it on Mercer's show uh, that his goal is to win a tournament scoping uh, before he hangs it up. That will be epic. You realize that. The ultimate, the ultimate, ultimate old school guy wins at scoper. Mm-hmm. Hoping tournament. That he's in twenty first right now. <clears throat> well, he's got some ground to go. Yeah, but I mean, he's not a bad shape. No, by no stretch. Is that the open? I mean, is that the elites in Florida? Yeah. How's that shaking out? Just out of my curiosity, I didn't have. I didn't look today yet. Um. Well, they only got two days of practice. Right. I heard that. So. Right now, 18 pounds is leading it on day one. But there's some names up there. Mark Menendez always catches them there. Uh, Greg Hackney's in the top 10. Todd Otten. You fish against Todd Otten, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all of them. All of the above. They're catching the heck out, out of uh, small fish. A lot of a lot of five fish for seven pounds. Five fish. That's vint- classic Florida. Yeah, I mean, and it's early. It's early in the day yet. Yeah. I imagine as the sun gets up, things will start to change a little bit. Is there their spawn? Is there is it over now or is it tailing out? Uh, tailing out. There's still a few fish on beds. I think John Cox is targeting a few, and some of the guys who spawn are targeting a few. I think it, that's wild in Florida. I mean, they you can fish for spawners what six months out of the year if you really want to. Yeah, depending on where you go and what yeah. you find. 
I, I've I've seen I've seen end of November December start, um, and and ha- and seen it go all the way to the beginning of May, but mm-hmm. um, I think I think um, I would be if if the most of the spawn is over, I would be totally shell bed fishing. Probably. And I wonder yeah. if Block it's going to disown Rick Clun now. That'll be interesting. <laughs> Are you just lobbing up a softball for me to hit out of the park? <clears throat> because, I don't know. Because I, I just, um, you know, it's a tool that we have to our trade, and if you don't master it. Then you end up posting six times a day bitching about it. Right. Well, the thing is, is if you're a, <laughs> if you're a professional tournament angler and you don't embrace this, yeah, then – you've only got a chance to do good in a handful of tournaments. uh, If you just fun fish and you don't explore it and take the elements that you like and leave the elements that you don't, right. You're not maximizing your time on the water. Right. A hundred percent. Like I, like I don't scope, I scope crappies more than I do bass by a long shot. And I use it to enhance my, the, the way I fish. Um, You know, we don't need to do this. No, we had such we, a good show. We had a great show. I feel like that was uh, my doing. I apologize. All right, let's rewind it. <laughs> <laughs> let's rewind it. Ben's making a nice comeback. He's in the top twenty right now. There you go. He's got a limit a limit for ten pounds. That could change too. That that yep. could get better too. All right. Uh, next week. Stay tuned. We'll be back on Thursday. I'm not. I don't know if it'll be live next week. Like I said, I uh, I'm looking at my big calendar here, and I'm like, holy cow. Uh, yeah, we're leaving in a week because I go from the Cat Owners Tournament on Norfolk directly to the Bassmaster Open in Alabama, and then you are actually going to be gone the first week of May. So we might have might either do a live show earlier next week, or I don't know. Or, we'll or deal I with could, that off. I could potentially. I could potentially bring my computer with me and do it live wherever I'm going. We'll do it live. <laughs> uh, well, that doesn't work because on May 2nd, I will be on uh, Logan Martin practicing. Okay. So, so we'll have to, you and I have to get together and figure out when we're going to record all these. Yeah. Because there's a bunch of stuff dropping that we have to make sure. Oh yeah. There's things yeah. happening. We'll have to do some coordinating. Just you know what? I'll just have my people call your people, and then they'll figure it out. Perfect. At work, which which basically means Matt's going to call me later. <laughs> <laughs> this has been another edition of Day Four with the man Frank Scalish, Natural Lakes, and and grandfather, <laughs> and a grandfather. The importance of those, not in that order. It would go grandfather. Shad Week, Natural Lake Show. Perfect. (laughs) All right, we'll talk to everybody next week. See ya.